What's going on, Wolfpack? My name is Dunarik Wolf, and welcome back to some more Bosnia Reacts to Geography Now, Syria, and Flag Slash Fan Friday, Syria this time. Okay, as you can see behind me, I am in my new place. This is going to be the first recording and or first video in my new setup. And as you can see behind me is just a white wall, and in front of me is just a white wall, which... Uh, may create this uh, echoey effect because I haven't set up my studio entirely just yet. And also you might hear th the fan from my computer, which is actually just right next to me. I didn't have another place to put it really. But um, it'll do for now. I can, do, I can start doing recordings now so I don't have to leave you guys in the dark for too long. But uh, videos should be coming out normally from here on out. Okay, so I think without further ado, we'll just uh, start the video here. What does that say? Levant. This is the very beginning of the video, and already he's mentioning the Levant, the region you see right there. And this looks like a map of the oil locations of the Middle East. So you kind of got like, I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, this is going to be a video about Syria. We all know what's what happened in Syria or what's still going on in Syria. But um, there's going to be a lot to say about uh, this episode because uh, Syria's history goes way back. And I mean, as far back as, well, written history goes. But anyway, I'll mention more in the video. Let's just start it off. All right, we are back to the Levant or Bilad al-Sham. In the Arab world family, That's it's kind of like Arabs the old man it. reading a book, but then he lifts his sleeves, revealing scars and tattoos that tell stories of every chapter of his life. He's a complicated man with a story way too difficult to summarize. But for what it's worth, I'll try to get as much palpable about information right. shoved into whatever amount of time we have. I'll do my best and take my job seriously. <laughs> that was seriously bad. <laughs> He can't be serious. Okay, I'll hey everybody, I'm your host, punch myself for that one. Mug or Geography Now merch at GeographyNow.com. It's not selling out if it's your brand. So I actually did entertain the thought of possibly visiting Syria for this episode. So I asked you guys, the Syrian Geography peeps, if there was any way I could. More or less, most of you kind of responded like this. We would love it if you could come and things are getting better, but now may not be the best time. Even well, if I fly over Lebanon well. and maybe take a bus across... No, no. We love that you really want to come, but uh, we would totally get it if, uh, you know, you wanted to sit this one out. So I took your advice and decided to hold off on it. Well, unfortunately, uh, as things stand currently, Syria is the most dangerous country in the world. It was ranked 190-something out of 190-something countries, and it was very dead last on uh, the safety index. So, uh... Maybe, yeah, visiting Syria might not be the best time. Currently, maybe in a few years, things will calm down and tourism will pick up again, but uh, that is yet to be determined, so. Syria trip. Nonetheless, you know what that means. If I can't go, then I have to bring Syria here. Any of you guys, the Syrian geography peeps, will be featured in this video. You guys submitted your own videos. Super excited for you guys to meet them. It's gonna be awesome. Quite a lot of stuff going on. Let's begin. <laughs> Oh god, that's loud. <laughs> so before we dive into the map, you have to understand some Is it loud for you all? I don't think so. The shape be. and borders that you see here right now are technically what Syria looks like today. However, these borders were only shaped in the 20th century. Prior to that, the areas that Syria has today were subject to a myriad of empires, kingdoms, oh, yeah. sultanates, protectorates, and state statuses. It would take way too long to cover, but throughout thousands of years, Syria went through the Neolithic period, the Ebla Kingdom, Mesopotamia years, old Assyrian empires, then the Hittites, Canaanites, Phoenicians, Neo-Assyrians and Neo-Babylonians, Achaemenids, Persians, Greeks, even the Armenians got in for a little bit. Then the Romans, the Byzantines, the Arab Rashidun's conquered, bringing in Islam, the Umayyads, Abbasids, Mongols even took a quick stab at it for some reason. Then the Ottoman Turks took over for like 400 years, and the French were the last ones to hold on to it until they got independence in the 40s. But then they joined Egypt as one super Arab nation. But then they were like, eh, not feeling it. Peace out, Egypt, but we're keeping the flag. Then the Al-Assad family takes over the country since 1971. And here we are today with the current state we have. And Okay, so that was a very, very, very fast uh, summary of uh, the history of Syria. Okay, so buckle yourselves up for this one, because I'm going to be talking more in detail about the history of Syria. So, I'm not going to mention the Neolithic era and all those things. Uh, you get how it works. People started making pottery and all this stuff, blah, 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 tools. Uh, I, agriculture really started off like in this area, Fertile Crescent, which uh, Syria is a part of, all the way, for those who don't know, all the way down 
from the Nile up through uh, Palestine, Lebanon, and through Syria, then all the way back down through Mesopotamia where the first cultures uh, started to arise and it would make this crescent shape, therefore the fertile crescent where agriculture really started to boom uh, for the first time in human history. So, okay, that's the Neolithic era and prehistory, but the true history of Syria really starts off with the kingdom of Ebla. Kingdom of Ebla, not Elba, not Alba, not Jessica Alba, Ebla. Okay, so all the way back in 3500 BC. That's how far back it goes. Pretty damn far back. Um, so anyway, so people there started to organize more and more into little city-states because really, um, you know, city-states were the norm back in the day, especially around uh, the areas of well, the Levant and the Mediterranean. So that's all nice. And it was named after uh, a well city, El Ebla, or Iblis, as it is known today. Around that, It's a smaller city today, but uh, that's where really the history of Syria really got really started off. So uh, one might ask, oh, we're, since it's called Syria, there's the people known as the Assyrians. Were they the ones who settled this area and created those uh, city-states and polises? Uh, no. More or less, Syria doesn't have much or at all to do with the Assyrians, uh, who are a, a different people group to what today what you think of today as the Syrians, which are mostly Levantine Arabs, uh, with a, a whole myriad of minorities, including the Assyrians themselves, but uh, the Assyrians never really played a huge role in the history of Syria. More or less, the Assyrians rose in what is today northern Iraq. That's where you would have the Assyrians, and uh, you know the Assyrians would have their kingdoms as well. There would be ups and downs. Um, they would have their own, you know, they would make alliances, they would trade, they would uh, make their own empires. I'm talking about the Assyrians from northern Iraq. Uh, they would get conquered by other empires. The Mongols came in, uh, Timur came in and kind of massacred a lot of them. Timur was a, a Turkic uh, leader of the Ilk Khanate, basically what is uh, today Persia after the Mongols uh, became the ruling class in that area, and um, he called himself the Sword of Islam, even though he killed a lot of Muslims, but he then ended up massacring a lot of Assyrians, and they kind of ended up becoming a micronation after that. It was just a massive genocide of young know, peoples at the time. Uh, so the Assyrians would be chilling a lot, they're, they're, the Ottomans would come in, and they would start, well, suppressing them as well and they can just ju they just can't catch a break they also have this very cool flag if i can find it i'll put it up very cool flag for the assyrians and um so yeah there, there remain about three million assyrians to this day they're christian by the way so um so what does that have to do with syria going back to the question i know i went off on a tangent there but you got to learn about the assyrians uh, as well, which are separate from Syria. So basically, I'll summarize it like this. The the Greeks, who gave the name to the area, called it Syria back in the day, or Syria, anglicized today. So they named it after the Assyrians, even though they weren't in the area of today's uh, Syria. The people who occupied the area of Syria back in the day were mostly the Phoenicians along the coast, which a lot have heard of. They were excellent sailors. And the Aramanians, more inland. Not the Armenians, Aramanians. They're different. And um, they they took a look at the Assyrians, and they took a look at the Ar Aramanians and the Phoenicians, and they thought they all looked the same. So they're like, oh, just Assyrians, so this place is Syria. <laughs> okay, that's a little well, crude, but that's, that's how the, the story goes. So anyway... Uh, so Syria never really had a proper statehood throughout much of its history. So the reason behind this is Syria's geography. So basically, if you take a look at the map of Syria, all it is is basically uh, a coastline divided by mountains, which, which the Phoenicians mostly occupied at the time. And uh, when you go more inland, you find the larger cities of Damascus, for, uh, for example. 
So uh, you have the cities of Damascus and uh, Idlib all in a relatively flat plain. Deserty, but relatively flat. And along the Euphrates River, uh, you would also have a lot of uh, uh, towns and uh, cities as well. So if a conqueror wanted to go along conquering uh, Syria, all they would have to do is get off the mountains into the plains, just follow the rivers, that's where the people lived, and conquer little by little. Or if you want to conquer the coast, just come by ship and then conquer the coastline. It would be difficult for the coastline and the inland areas of Syria to communicate with each other. It would be a lot easier for the the uh, coastline areas to communicate with other coastlines. Uh, so that's a thing as well. So because of that, unfortunately, they have been conquered over and over again by the Achaemenid Empire, by the well, Persian empires, by the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Arab Caliphates, you name it. Okay, so after the kingdom of Ebla fell, you would have other city-states rising. Uh, one significant one is the uh, city-state of Ugarit. Uh, near what is today Latakia, uh, they are well known for the Ugarit uh, text, which was a cuneiform type of text, uh, which I'll I'll put up if I can find it. I'll I'll put it up here uh, ish, so you can take a look at it. Uh, that is, as far as we know, one of the oldest texts in all of human history. It's uh, nearly six thousand years old, the oldest written form of uh, well human handwriting, basically. So uh, that's pretty interesting. So they were just chilling. They were pre doing pretty well during the Bronze Ages. And as we know, the Bronze Age collapse happened. The Sea People moved in, uh, which were, uh, as far as we know, a confederation of Indo-European people groups that were forced uh, into a, a forced migration due to hunger and uh, I would guess bad climates more in uh, Northern Europe. That's the, the theory, at least. Uh, we, we'll probably never know exactly who they were, but they were forced to migrate. They had no other choice but to settle other areas of the world, of the world, as, as the the theory goes. And they got on their ships and they started to wreak havoc in in the uh, the Bronze Age world, which was all the way from Egypt to the Hittites and Anatolia uh, to as as we know Syria today, Palestine, you name it. <laughs> they were all messed up. So that's just one of the reasons for the uh, Bronze Age collapse, albeit one of the most important reasons. Another reason for the Bronze Age collapse was constant earthquakes over a period of 50 years, I believe, uh, droughts, famines, uh, you name it. But whatever happened, you know, over that period of time led to the Bronze Age collapse and the well, collapse of civilization at the time. Only really the Egyptians survived uh, the uh, Bronze Age collapse though albeit the egyptians would never really recover after that because it was so brutal so basically a complete anarchy happened after that well wh whoever the survivors were there was just basic anarchy and a terrible standard of living until the iron age came around so after all this havoc uh, you would have the persian empire move in and uh, will conquer the areas swiftly and as we know uh the persian empire got conquered themselves by the uh the macedonian empire led by of course alexander the great uh, afterwards alexander the great died and his successors his generals basically carved up uh, a part of the Macedonian Empire into their you know, own spheres of influences. Uh, and uh, Syria, I believe, was part of the Seleucids. Don't, don't quote me on that one. I believe it was part of the Seleucid Empire, which was b basically centered around Persia again, or today's Iran. And again, a long period of time will pass until the Roman Empire uh, comes in and again adds Syria to its own sphere of influence until, yet again... Uh, we would have the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, and then the Eastern Roman Empire moves in, uh, started, starts to induce, introduce uh, Christianity to the region, then Islam comes in, expanding swiftly, uh, coming into Syria as well. There's an interesting story when uh, Muhammad uh, came to Syria, and for the first time ever, a Christian met uh, met Muhammad and the Muslims, and it was an old man, I believe. And, uh, you know, Muhammad would come into Syria and he would say, 
I am the uh, you know the messenger of God, and then an old old Syrian Christian man uh, walks up to him and says, "You are no messenger of God. No messenger of God would carry a sword." And so that was the first time a Christian met Muhammad for the first time, and th the expansion of the Islamic. Uh, caliphate and so with the expansion of the islamic caliphate you would have an arabization going on and uh, arabic would be the official language from now on in the province of syria at the time so we would have an arabization people start learning arabic uh, start identifying more as arabs and so syria would be in the islamic golden age and things seem to be you know going well for them Finally, for once. And um, after a while, we all know that the good times always end. The Mongols come around and they mess shit up. They like really messed up the region. Uh, killing, slaughtering, whoever didn't surrender to the Mongol superiority would most likely be killed. That uh, messed up the economy of the region. It messed up Syria, most definitely. And as we, as I've already mentioned before, uh, Timur would come over when the Ilk Khanate. Uh, after the Ilk Khanate fell, you would have the Ottomans rise swiftly and take over the region of today's Syria. Again, Syria is a part of another uh, larger empire or nation. And things would go on like that for another 400 years for the Syrians. Wow, will they ever catch a break? Uh, well... The Ottomans collapsed, as any empire does. Uh, the Ottomans collapse, and in come the French, an Indo-European people group, now swoop in to the region. And you know, the French would claim large swaths of the, Le the Levant, and while the uh, British would claim other parts of Mesopotamia, specifically Iraq, for example. Uh, and there would there would be some, you know transfers of land like the uh, French found a lot of oil around Mosul which was part of I believe the protectorate of Syria at the time when the French were around and the British kind of forced them to give it up to them and add it onto uh, their domain in Iraq because they they found oil around Mosul so of course the British would want it uh, so th there would be some shifting of borders there would be the infamous Sykes-Picot agreement where two diplomats one French and one uh, a British diplomat got together and just drew random lines in the sand and declared, okay, this is yours and this is mine. And that's kind of what we're left with today. Um, in my opinion, that really led to the region being messed up. There's more regions. There's more reasons the region is really messed up today, but that's definitely one of them, the Sykes-Picot Agreement. Uh, so Syria would gain its independence afterwards. The, the French were like, okay, uh, now you're independent, have fun. And well, the Syrians never really ruled over themselves. As I explained, for much of its history, the Syrians were ruled by someone else. And now they were left to rule themselves. And they were like, huh? How do you do this ruling thing? And then there would be military coup after military coup. Uh, so then they would try to make a large Arab nation because they were proponents of pan-Arabism. Uh, which was the idea of, uh, you know, the Arab world forming into one large nation, very, very, uh, you know, ambitious. So Egypt and Syria got together and said, you know what, let's let's try this. But after only three years, it, it was formed in uh, 1958, I believe. And only three years later, 1961, the whole thing fell apart. There were too many logistical uh, problems specifically right in between them notice that there's Israel which would keep them from communicating with each other so the only reason way of communication would be by sea that didn't work there was a lot of disagreements between the leaders you know uh, Syria was like you know what uh, Egypt we're done it was cool but also I'll keep the flag yeah the, that's how Syria ended up with that cool looking pan-arabic flag and uh, only a few years later, again, more coups start happening, uh, but things would start to calm down after one final coup happened, uh, where the father of Bashar al-Assad took over. I forgot his name. Maybe I'll put it up on screen. Uh, yeah, that's Bashar al-Assad's uh, father, uh, who is basically today's president of Syria. We, he's a dictator, but okay. Um, 
So he so he takes over, and surprisingly, Syria starts doing well. Well, they lose a few wars to Israel. Uh, there would be the Six Day War, the Yom Kippur War. Uh, they would lose the Golan Heights to Israel, or two thirds of it at least. Uh, to Israel, which is a very strategic uh, location for Israel because a lot of the rivers and streams uh, start to flow from the Golan Heights, so it's a very strategic location for them. But okay, uh, so Syria loses those wars, but things actually go surprisingly well during the rule of the al-Assads. Uh, the economy was doing not too bad, you know, institutions were being built up, uh, the infrastructure was being built up, and uh, his father would pass away Bashar al-Assad's father would pass away in 2000 and he took over for 11 years as we know and then bad things start to happen a series of large droughts caused by well uh, global warming and climate change start to happen people are becoming more and more discontent with the government not doing much about it so massive protests arise the Arab Spring begins which was uh, basically all the Arab uh, nations rising up and trying to change change their leadership, preferably to something more democratic. But we all know that they will not give up their uh, leadership that easy. And then a long war that's still going on today broke out. But the army of Bashar al-Assad took over much of the nation. And uh, Syria kind of looks like I'll put it up on the screen. Kind of looks like that as of me recording this video. So as you can see, parts of Syria are controlled by Kurdish fighters, parts of it by Turkey even. And we all know when Turkey moved into those uh, Kurdish areas and took over the place. Um, so that's a story. I'll, I'll, I'll get into more of that during the video. But there you go. Um, a very, very, very long, the very long history of Syria condensed and here we are today so anyway let's find out more about the syrian people and syrian food and stuff <laughs> and that's not even scratching the surface first let's take a look at the globe shouts we first of all syria lies in the middle east bordered by five other countries this general area east of the mediterranean that syria lies in is historically known as the levant making syria a levantine country syria's boundaries today are essentially the byproduct of post-ottoman era delineation lines created by the sykes pico agreement of mm -hmm. 1916 allocating the boundaries of modern day syria to france the last country to hold the area under mandate status since independence the northern and southern borders have had some conflict in regards to territorial disputes in the north of syria along with the border of turkey these areas are sometimes called western kurdistan or rojava and they are heavily administered by the kurdish community that has some level of self-proclaimed autonomy from the rest of syria otherwise at the tri-point with lebanon and israel they have the golan heights dispute this entire valley has been in conflict since 1964 as there are no formal treaties or documents describing the exact boundary and both sides claim it today israel occupies most of the golan heights and up to the un disengagement observer force or undof alpha line and from there the un's patrolling force stands guard in the buffer zone all the way up to the UNDOF line Bravo. Within this buffer zone, Syria occupies small towns and even the peak of Mount Hermon, the tallest mountain in the region. There's a lot more that goes into this, but that's the general layout. The capital city is Damascus, known as the City of Jasmine, widely considered the oldest continuously inhabited city on Earth. Here, of course, you can also find the largest and busiest airport, Damascus International. Nonetheless, the largest city is actually Aleppo, a little bit further up north, followed mm -hmm. by Homs at number three, just between them and Damascus. The largest shipping port of the country, though, is actually the port of Latakia, which has been in continuous use since 2000 BC. Speaking of coasts, Syria only has about five main small islands in the Mediterranean, the largest being Arwad, just off the coast of Tartus, known for its ancient citadel. The country is divided into 14 mm. governorates, however, the governorate of Conetra, pretty sure I mispronounced that, sorry, is essentially the disputed Golan Heights area. All the administration is located east of the DOF Bravo line, but some of the towns are located within the buffer zone, some literally on the Alpha buffer line. Finally, the majority of the population population lives in an upside down crescent shape that hugs the borders with Lebanon and Turkey and flows down Fertile the river. Crescent. This means that most of the population can be reached via the two main highways, the M5 and M4. Syria also has an extensive rail network, both cargo and passenger, that more or less falls within the same pattern of population distribution as well. Now keep in mind, as of upload for this video in 2021, due to recent ongoing conflicts, many of the rail lines have either halted or changed operation schedules. And of course, based on whatever the social climate is of that day, driving between cities, you may or may 
may not have to pass through security checkpoints. The rules are always kind of changing and there doesn't seem to be a set system in place. In addition, Syria is incredibly rich with distinct ancient sites unlike anywhere on Earth. Yeah, unfortunately about those ancient sites, I think this is showing Palmyra right there. It's more to the southeast of of Syria and that place was largely destroyed by ISIS, uh, the Islamic State in Iraq and uh, Syria. The, the organization itself has basically fallen apart into basically nothingness nowadays, but the damage the damage they have done is just, well, immeasurable and uh, I don't know, uh, a lot of those ancient sites will never be its own thing ever again unless they well rebuild the place i guess they can always do that but the original statues and the things isis destroyed will forever be gone unfortunately let alone six unesco heritage sites it's kind of unfortunate though because the aftermath of current conflicts have decreased tourism somewhere around 75 percent nonetheless the country is still moving forward to some degree and if you are lucky enough to find yourself in syria on a good day you should consider checking out some of the top notable places let's give it to one of you guys the syrian geography to explain this time i believe it is gaida the guide she's literally a tour guide in syria this is Gaida, I'm a tour guide in Syria. Let's start with my city, Damascus, the Umayyad Mosque. It's one of the oldest places dedicated for worship. Next would be definitely From the Umayyad Palmyra, Caliphate. the beautiful oasis in the Syrian yeah. desert with its beautiful monuments. People worship 61 different gods there, and they all live peacefully and in harmony. Now that's remarkable. Busra is also a special place to my heart. It's breathtaking. Also, one of my favorite places to visit is Malula. It's literally carved into the mountains. Amrit, the Phoenician city with the oldest Olympic stadium in the world. Also, Crack the Chevalier, the village of Saidnaya, the coastal area, and of course, Aleppo and Hama. Oh, I should mention uh, here, there are still people that define themselves as Aramanians. Uh, what I want to conclude with is that Syria is an underrated country and I can guarantee you'll learn a lot and enjoy every minute of it. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Gaida. Check out her Instagram and uh, hit her up if you ever want to go. <laughs> is she really Syria. called That's Gaida? Quite how much Syria That's interesting. Holds a link to the past and tries its best to maintain it. And one other thing that gives them structure she was destined is to be a the land guide. they live upon. Which brings us to... <laughs> Okay, so when okay, most you people really think of Syria and what it looks like, they tend to just kind of default to what they've seen in the news. You know, conflict in dry, dusty deserts, beige and yellow stones. Yeah, that perspective needs an upgrade. Let's check it out on the globe one more time. Motion graphic, go! Syria lies right on the northwestern edge of the Arabian Plate, split on the Dead Sea fault line. This is basically what causes the entire mountainous western region of Syria. In the north, you have the Bargilus or Nusaria Mountains, which is, of course, as you can see, the most fertile, green, and lush part of the country. To the south, you have the anti-Lebanon Mountains, mountains, where, as we already explained, you can find the highest peak, Mount Hermon. Inland from the fault line, you have the Palmyra Fold Belt, a byproduct of the Dead Sea fault line, which creates two small hill chains, the Rujmain and Ruwak ranges. They fade downwards into the vast, sparsely inhabited Syrian desert. To the very south, you find the Asafa and Jabal Adruz volcanic fields. The land is made up of dark basaltic lava fields with about 40 mostly Holocene or extinct cinder cones. The longest river of the country is, of course, the mighty Euphrates river that originates in Turkey, fed Not by really two navigable. other major rivers flowing southward, the Balikh and Khabur. Within the flow path of the Euphrates, you find the largest inland body of water, Lake Assad, which is actually a reservoir created by the Topka Dam in the south side. These waterways are essentially the lifeblood of the entire eastern side of the country. Yeah, unfortunately for them in those waterways, uh, they're not under control of those waterways. Turkey, uh, you know, the Tigris and the Euphrates r River flow from the mountains of Anatolia in today's Turkey and it is I believe one Turkish minister said at one point uh, you Arabs can uh, have all the oil you want we'll drink your water <laughs> uh, just just goes to show like how much influence Turkey has over the region thinks thinks in large that they control their water sources basically and you would see a series of dams. there's many uh, hydroelectric power stations but one is like right here near the Syrian Turkish border they just slapped a dam right there uh, so which uh, lowers the flow of water as you know and which would make agriculture more difficult in the region that also probably uh contributed to the 2011 uh war as well 
be and have been for civilizations for millennia. Finally, Syria is made up of four distinct eco-regions. You have the Eastern Mediterranean Broadleaf Forest Zone, which is concentrated mostly on the coastal mountains by the sea. Then you have the Zeric Grass and Shrublands in the middle inland section of the country. Zeric just means a place that's very dry. Country. Just south of that, you have the Mesopotamian Shrub Desert, the driest and most sparsely populated part of the country. And finally, in very small sections, you can actually find southern Anatolian deciduous forest zones locked in sections of the western mountain ranges. The trees here actually look different from the Mediterranean broadleaf zone, so yeah. So, as you can see from that motion graphic, there's quite a bit going on with Syria's natural side. Volcanoes, who would have thought? In any case, with much land to work with, Syria is also a place known for its industry and fiscal output. That means it's time for my triple shot of espresso break which means Noah. Okay, so regarding the geography of Syria, you would think it's entirely a, a desert. So how would 18 million people be able to feed themselves? Uh, well, there's not just agriculture near the Euphrates River. If you zoom into around the cities of like Damascus and Aleppo, you would notice very fertile plains. Okay, so it's not entirely just a desert land. On scene and ready. Let's roll. Now, economically speaking, in addition to the effects of conflict, sanctions against Assad's government from numerous nations and ideals like the Arab League, the EU, and the US played into their collapse. Most major enterprises in Syria are nationalized, but in 2001, private banking was made legal and in 2004, they formed their own small domestic market. So in a way, they are kind of attempting to switch things up and experiment with new finance methods, which are slowly kind of working. One thing that helps, of course, thanks to their diverse landscape is a relatively abundant resource reservoir. Now, most outsiders might assume Syria is a major petroleum producer, and although they do have a hydrocarbon belt, mostly in the deserts in the northeast, and it does account for about a quarter of their state's revenue and has been their major export since 19. It's actually around a half of their economy, so oil is still very important to Syria. <laughs> For. Nonetheless, on a global scale, they aren't really a major powerhouse producer. Not as much as Not Saudi Arabia. <laughs> but you'll know we are still keeping our eyes on them. Of course you are. Syrians actually export more olive oil than crude oil. It is their prized resource and they don't just use it for food. One thing you will definitely hear every Syrian praising, Aleppo soap made with olive oil. This stuff dates back thousands of years and the technique is still used today. You you guys have sent me this stuff on Fan Friday, I love it. It usually comes in boxes that look like this. Soap looks like this. It has a very raw, earthy smell, and when you use it, it feels like you just took a shower with history. Buy it. Fun. Yeah, some of the oldest soaps in all of human history, basically just made of olive oil, lye, and water. Or they, I guess uh, the Syrians add laurel as well. So a very simplistic uh, type of soap, I guess. Uh, which is interesting. I would like to try that, though I would have to... Maybe I should like open a P.O. box one day and people can start sending me in stuff because, well, traveling the entire world, as much as I would like to do it, is very time-consuming and costs a lot of money. So I would think, like, you know, bring the world to me instead and I can check out the stuff people send me in and review review the stuff. Fun fact, Damascus <laughs> but was also known maybe for producing some of the most prized steel in antiquity with a special technique that is all but lost today. Many have tried to replicate it, but none have had much success. Well, there's more than just resources in this country. Believe it or not, there's even flora and fauna to discuss. And who better to discuss it than Gary Harlow? Roy, Gary Harlow. Yeah, you don't need that. Ecosystem is pretty you don't much need divided that. East and West. Currently, the country has two nature reserves, two state forests, and over 30 protected areas. Within these reserves, you might find some of the most distinct species you've ever heard of. Mountain gazelles, angora goats, the steppe eagle, and on the coast, you can find the angel shark and the Mediterranean monk seals. The Levite <laughs> viper Unk and black seal. desert cobras <laughs> call their rocky hills their homes. They pay rent there and everything. This does the death stalker How much is the rent? One of the most dangerous species of scorpion being in the world. I've eaten three of them. The national animal is actually the rare and endangered Syrian Chad. brown bear, whereas the national bird is the northern bald ibis. In fact, the due to recent conflicts, many of the wildlife have suffered and have either permanently migrated to other less affected areas or been dramatically reduced. And what Even they're migrating. The now extinct Syrian elephant. Syria used to have elephants. One animal they definitely have not reduced, though, would be the famous fat-tailed shark. It's said that top-notch baklava is made from the fat of the tail of these sheep. Speaking of what interesting parts of animals, remember that time we ate camel hump in Somaliland? Yeah. And that's all for me. Whoever wears this hat is Gary Harlow. Now Paul is Gary Harlow. 
I swear I have that kind of head as well. Syria definitely knows how to do food. They aren't called the Fertile Crescent for nothing. To expound a little bit more on the food of Syria, we have these two geographies to explain. Marhaba, my name is Amram. I come from a small town called Banyas in Syria. And today we're going to go over uh, some of the top foods in Syria. The Syrian cuisine is a part of uh, the Eastern Mediterranean cuisine. Magdus is a usually breakfast, so breakfast good. food. It's a cured eggplant stuffed with red peppers, walnuts, and dipped in uh, olive oil. We have also Wara Ainab, uh, Maha, <laughs> <Sarma. laughs> Maklube, Kusab Laban, uh, Sheikh Al Mahshi, more common in Damascus, uh, Cherry Kebab, which is uh, so popular among the Armenian population oh. in Aleppo, sweets. Uh, that looks good. Middle Eastern food is usually good. Or you know, comfort food that we have um, is eating Medine. rice and yogurt. So I have like my cooked Doesn't rice sound here, very some fresh Syrian. yogurt, and then I put a bit of allspice or seven spices. This is a very popular seasoning that we use. Um, so this is what it looks like. You basically just eat rice and yogurt as a snack. At least that's Person. what Syrians okay. do, and it's phenomenal. It's literally like my comfort food. Thanks, Jagger Peeps. Well, that's all I got in this segment. Cheers to you all, and Barb's back to you. Thank you, Noah. Also, yes, Syrians are obsessed with yerba mate. They are one of the top importers from South American countries, especially Argentina. Fun fact, if it's cold, it's called terre. Watch the Paraguay episode. Also, they are one of the top producers. Yeah, I saw that once. It's like where people have like that stuff inside of a cup. And, and they drink it. I thought it was like uh, marijuana in a cup or something. I'm like, what? Because it was from 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 South America. I was like, wait, are they drinking marijuana now? Apparently, that's completely wrong. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I could try that again. Maybe if I open a PO box, somebody can send me one of those. Maybe I can try it out for myself. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, no, it's not weed. It's Yerba mate. <laughs> of Arak, their centuries-old tradition, aniseed liquor, invented by Arab Muslims in the 12th century. Isn't that like haram? Yeah, it technically is. I'll leave that up to you guys that are more knowledgeable in Islamic doctrine. Any <laughs> that brings us to the act. Well, the Bosniaks are Muslim, and a lot of them, well, drink alcohol at Akia, for example. Uh, it has been that way for for many generations now. I know my granddad who who drank at Akia before, so he was he lived to be 102 years old or 103, I think. Uh, so it's kind of been a tradition, even though despite the fact that the Bosniaks you know, are a Muslim people group. And there's no debate in the country, like, should we drink alcohol or not? So we just drink it if we want to. Actual people of Syria. The Syrians. So let's discuss them in the next part. The... So I asked you guys now I'm what curious. it means to be Syrian. Here are some things you guys, the Syrian... I want to look so now. As Syrian, I feel very proud to be part of the... Of the historical Anthony, very cycle Syrian of name. The, of the earth, I feel very sad and upset when the word of Syria uh, been mentioned only for war subjects. Actually, uh, Syrian history is very, very massive. Uh, so I, yes. all Syrians again look different, and this can this can change depending on what region of Syria you're from. Yeah, you look so, like uh, that's something that I also you're from Europe or something. Know. A lot of people think I'm French um, just because of my the way I look, my my complexion, uh, my blue eyes, my my curly like brown hair. Again, Syria is one of the oldest civilizations, and it still preserves that culture regardless of that uh, European. Um, I guess descent or change. I'm very proud being a Syrian citizen because Syria is the cradle of civilization, the fertile crescent, you know. Debatable. The oldest civilizations in the world, in the recorded history, have thrived on the Syrian soil. Syria has also helped other nations. For example, in 2006, the Lebanese refugee crisis. We also hosted the Iraqi refugees. So Syria is like, uh, I would say, she's the carrying mother of the Arab world. If you have yeah, did I mention uh, Syria kind of occupied? Lebanon for a while until all the way like 2005, kind of though. Ever decided to visit, you'll end up meeting the most genuine and hospitable people and you'll be having an amazing experience. Thank you. Syria is a complex country of peoples. They are shaped by all eras of civilization that have passed through for the past 10 or so millennia. But first, let's break it down. 
motion graphic time. First of all, the country has about 18.5 million people. However, pre-war, their population was around 23 million. About 10 million have been internally displaced, and over 5 million have fled since 2011. The country is made up primarily of Syrian Arabs, or Levantine Arabs, at about 74%. The second largest group are Kurds at about 9-10%. to From here, things get a little confusing. It's often said that Turkmen Syrians are the third largest group, but there aren't any real reliable estimates on their exact numbers. In any case, after that, about 4% of the population are Assyrian, 1.5% Circassian, 1% Armenian, and the rest are a slew of various other minority groups like Albanians, Georgians, Greeks, Persians, Pashtuns, Russians, and Bosnians. They use the Syrian as their currency. They use a type C. Okay, I don't know many Bosnians that live in Syria, but I might be wrong. Who knows? <laughs> Bosnians are really everywhere at this point. E and L plug outlets, and they drive on the right side of the road. Now back to the identity thing. What exactly is the term Levantine or Levantine Arab? This was actually a question that I asked a lot of you guys, the Syrian geography peeps. And more or less, this is the answers that you guys kind of gave me. It's not very easy to explain, but in the most condensed way to put it, it's not originally Arab. Of course, over the centuries, numerous empires and communities came in and intermixed, so most of the population will probably have a genetic admixture paralleling these groups. But what it boils down to is that Levantines are more of an indigenous Mediterranean people group, and some will say that their lineage goes as far back to the ancient Canaanites. In any case, besides that, Syria's population is kind of broken down into two categories, ethnic and religious. And you know what, I've actually been talking a long time. Let's have someone else fill in. Ian, uh, here, why don't you have a segment? The people actually kind of like you. Oh, here we go. Now, we don't have time to get into deep detail for each group. There are so many, but some to highlight were already mentioned in the graph. You have the largest group, the Kurds, sometimes called Rojava Kurds. They mostly live in the north part of the country. I made a video on it. If you want to check it out, we explain the Kurds. The Turkmen Syrians date back to the Seljuk Empire, a Turco-Persian empire, and many more came during Ottoman times as well. The Armenians have a long history of inhabiting Syria. The largest migration came during the Ottoman times when there was a lot of conflict that drove them out. You have the Cypriot originated Greeks, mostly found in the coastal areas, nice, some of whom are actually Muslim, which is pretty rare for Greeks. Don't get an Arab Syrian confused with an Assyrian. They have their I own didn't. language, their own alphabet, their own flag. Most of them straddle lands across Syria and Iraq and are predominantly Christian. Thank you, Wayne. Good job. Ow. For the religion part, of course, Sunni Islam and Sunni-based schools of teaching are the predominant faith, whereas another 10 or so percent are mostly Shia and Shia-based sects like Alawis or Nusayris. Most of them are concentrated on the Mediterranean coast, and interestingly enough, it is the sect of the ruling Assad family that they are tied with. Another 10 percent is yeah, mostly Christian Alawites. and Christian-based sects like Maronite. Uh, interesting thing about the Alawites, uh, they're a Muslim uh, sect, but they actually celebrate Christmas. So interesting. It's Arameans, Orthodox, Apostolic. They even have the oldest Arameans. church in the world. From there, about 3% are Druze, most of whom have large Druze. communities in the south of the country. And the rest are a group of other non- uh, Druze, that would just mean friend in, uh, in Bosnian. Every time I see that name Druze, I think Druze. <laughs> Some related faith communities like Romani, Mandeans, Yarsanis, and Yazidis. Some like Romani are North Indian based, and some like Yazidi are Iranic Zoroastrian based. Historically, there even used to be a large Sephardic Jewish community. They actually migrated after the expulsion from Spain in the 15th century. Basically, Syria allows religious freedom. However, by constitutional law, the president must always be Muslim. So anyway, language-wise, Arabic is the official language. No, you don't say. Yep, it is. But of course, they speak with a Levantine accent. Here are some of you guys explaining the Levantine accent. Go for it. It's called the Levantine Arabic or Shami Arabic. We do not uh, pronounce the letters th, uh, the, the, and qa. For example, uh, the word Qamar means moon. We pronounce it as Amar. We're talking about a country Amar. that is smaller okay. than Colorado in area, and still I can count 25 or even more local dialects. So it's really not enough to talk about them in a short video, but I hope this helps. Uh, in Syrian accent, it's very tough. Like, for example, the A, uh, it's like very light. In Egyptian way, Sham. But uh, in Syrian one, Al Sham. It's very tough, very strong. And what a Sham. So in Levantine Arabic, <laughs> there's a lot of French, French esque words. With eggplant, we say aubergine. Uh, She's in French. Arabic, we say, um, sabun. 
and in Savon. French, it's Savon. Thank you. Throughout the Savon. country, though, you'll find Basque. small communal language isolates, mostly Semitic-based. For example, the town of Malula, they still speak Aramaic, the language that was spoken by Jesus. Moving on, though, of course, yep. as we mentioned, Syria's history has never been short of complicated, which brings us to the current situation of the civil war and crisis. Now, although this isn't even a sliver in the grand picture of Syria, we still, of course, have to cover it in this episode because it's kind of a big deal. We're not going to sidestep it. Depending on who you talk to, Syrians both in and out of Syria will have a lot to say about the current state of affairs of their home country. I asked you guys, the Syrian geography peeps, to kind of explain a little bit, and more or less, you all kind of came to these conclusions. What it boils down to is pretty much everybody on all sides wishes things could be better. They just all have different opinions on how to get to that. Lithuania. Center. There's no simple way to summarize it, but many might say that it all starts with two main factors. The proposition for construction of an oil pipeline from Qatar to Europe through Syria, and the Arab Spring uprisings that took place in 2011. Basically, both sides claim the other side was the instigator. Those that are against Assad will say, Assad and his family have been ruling as dictators since 1971, and he responded violently, hurting protesters, and then he did it again. And yet those that support Assad will probably say something like, Yeah, well, Western powers infiltrated in the Arab Spring, supplied protesters with weapons. And there's a lot more factored into this, but in the end, everything got super messy. Some soldiers defected and created a new rebel army, and then ISIS and Al-Qaeda got involved. All while this was happening, the Kurds were like, yeah, we figured something like this might happen and we are not letting them touch our communities. Time to secede. Then it gets even more complicated considering that Iran and Russia supported the Assad regime, whereas the GCC states and the US mm -hmm. supported the Very rebels, messy. effectively making a proxy war. Essentially, since 2016, this whole crisis and civil war led to the largest refugee population in the world since the Rwandan genocide. Now, there are so many layers that go into this, but everyone can agree that it has put Syria through a lot of strain and everyone is understandably sick and tired of it. So. <laughs> but one thing Syrians don't get tired of is sports. 500,000 people dead in the war, so by may the way. Well just do a sharp pounce. Now, usually Art fills in for this segment, but he is currently spending time with his family for the holidays. So let's bring in Gabs to fill in for the segment. Remember we went to Finland? That was awesome. That was the best time of my life. I haven't done anything fun since then. Syrians and sports, yes. For any major sporting event in Syria, Who's there's no better dude? place than the Abbasian Stadium in Damascus. It is the home of their national soccer or football team, as well as staging area for the couple of pan-Arab games. Latakia also hosted the 10th Mediterranean Games. Like most countries, soccer... Am I the only one that says Latakia? Everybody says Latakia. Surely it's Latakia, right? <laughs> or football is their favorite sport. These two guys probably being their most world-renowned players. Their national football team has qualified for four Asian Cup competitions. Otherwise, they show interest in other forms of athletics. No, really? Uh, yeah, they do. I swear. Yeah, yeah. In the Olympics, they have two bronze medals in boxing and weightlifting. Whew. One silver in wrestling and one gold medal in the Summer Olympics. Their only gold medalist today being Gadashua. Syria was so proud as she finished the women's heptathlon in 1996. Finally, at the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, which took place in 2021 due to the pandemic, obviously, Hen Saza at age 11 became the youngest Olympian in more than 50 years competing in table tennis. Hopefully some of their athletes will get endorsed and have their faces on cereal boxes. Oh! Thank you, Gabs. In any case, Syria's culture extends beyond athletics. The first alphabet was created and discovered here. Weddings can be crazy. Some groups have a ketbet, and it's usually followed by an arkada, and they prick the groom with pins, and women step on the toes of the bride, followed by a sword fighting banquet. Each group has something special and unique. To talk a little bit more about the backstory of their culture, here's Random Hannah with Culture Stuff. I have mixed hey, feelings everyone. about that one. I'm back. Did you miss me? Well, you can always have me on a Random Hannah shirt at geographynow.com. So oh, there, Anna. <laughs> it's a wildly parallel that of other Levantine nations in that you'll find a more Mediterranean vibe rather than an Arab one. And everywhere in Syria, you'll probably encounter the traditional Bafra house with a fountain in the middle courtyard. Occasionally, you might spot men wearing a shirwa I or kind of like a design and women with traditional kaftan mm. worn at special events. Speaking Fancy. of which, Syria is famous for their silk called damask 
or Damascan brocade fabric. Syrian what about Damascus Rose? And craft world as well. You can find intricately patterned wooden mosaic woodcraft in every marketplace. And it's believed that glass blowing was invented in Syria as a way to produce jars and vases faster than traditional clay methods. Syrians have a long standing tradition of holding prominent figures in the literature and arts department in the Arab world. These guys were key players in the Nadha or Arab literature and cultural revival of the 19th century. In addition, Syria is home to a multitude of contemporary artists. This guy, Ali Ferzat, was once the head of the Arab Cartoonist Association. Now all forms of media are state controlled, and since the Civil War, many artists have been incarcerated. Nonetheless, despite all that, As Syria always. still seems to be right up there with Egypt in terms of popularity in the Arab world with TV shows and dramas. If you'd like to find Dictators don't really like artists. Finally, and there writers. are so many festivals celebrated they inspire here, and each people group has their own rebellion regionally. So. They have two festivals dedicated to flowers in Latakia and Damascus. A cotton festival, Latakia, come on. <laughs> jasmine festival. Certain groups, like the Kurds and Turkmen, celebrate no ruse. The Assyrians have their own Assyrian New Year. Yazidis might have the Shanjak Parade, and so on. And unfortunately, you know the deal. This is the part where I usually say something like, you can't have a festival without music, and then I scoff as keys, music intro. Ugh. Join Team Hannah. Whoa. Uh, when they mention like alcohol is haram in Islam, well, also kind of music is haram in Islam. Most Muslim nations nowadays listen to music, so, <laughs> um, yeah. Whee! You can buy my shirt at geographynow.com. Um, anyway, music in Syria. Music here goes way back, like super ancient. It's actually said that the first musical notes in the world was actually discovered on ancient clay tablets. It was even played and recorded by Assyrian pianist Malik Jandali. Sorry for the wrong pronunciation. Otherwise, specifically Kudud Halabia and Muwasha in the city of Aleppo. They are music and poetry styles uniquely developed in Syria. And of course, you can't talk about music without mentioning two native instruments, the kanun and ney. The kanun being a trapezoid shaped zether and the ney being a narrow wooden flute ney. that has been used for nearly over 5,000 Do you want to play this ney? Syria is also <laughs> home to a ton of different styles of traditional dances. The most notable probably being dabke and the al sama dance which is more often performed by Sufi Muslims. Otherwise in a contemporary sense, Syria has yeah, Sufi Muslims, so always. many Danced. Notable singers and artists. Here are a few that you guys have mentioned. If I would could send them all out a key shirt, I probably would. Everyone says this guy is Sabah Frakri. He is kind of like the Pavarotti of the Arab world. And finally, like we've discussed in the Saudi Arabia episode, there is a sort of underground metal scene culture thing that goes on in Syria. And it's uh, hard for them to perform because of due to government restrictions. Many Syrian metalheads will probably cite Jack Power as the leading artist that pioneered metal into the country with his metal covers combining metal with traditional Arab instruments. All right, that's it for me, guys. I'm out. Woo. Don't buy Hannah's shirt. Stay Keith, everybody. Woo! Thank you, Keith. Well, so we've covered quite a bit. The land of a million stories. And part of that complex story involves outside countries that have played a role in their history. Let's discuss Syria's global interaction in... God damn, that's loud. <laughs> Might not be that's loud for you all, for me well it's like drama, super loud. Syria still has their way of dealing with the outside. You don't live in the cradle of civilization without being able to know a thing or two when it comes to international affairs and diplomacy. You have to understand, when you ask which country Syria is close to, it really depends on who you ask. And often you'll notice that there's a huge difference between what the government claims versus what the average everyday citizen claims and which group within the citizens you're asking. But here's the motion graphic. As an Arab nation, of course, they used to be a member of the Arab Arab League, but had their status suspended since 2011, when the civil war broke out. Nonetheless, Syrians still have their buddies, Arab or not. For one, South America has had its eye on Syria for a while, specifically Brazil and Venezuela. Brazil was the first country in the Americas to give humanitarian visas to Syrian refugees seeking asylum during war times. Brazil actually has the highest number of Syrians in diaspora at about 4 million, if you include multi-generational families and those That's of a lot of people. In addition, Venezuela not only has politically aligned with Syria's government for a long time, but also has many in diaspora as well, even their
their former vice president mm, bad place to go is of lebanese syrian descent now a little closer to Venezuela. home if you ask the no. syrian government they will probably state that russia and iran are their closest and in some cases most strategic allies this was very evident when they sided with iran against iraq in the iran iraq war as they shared a common animosity against saddam hussein in addition syria has been friends with russia for a long time and especially during the assad rulership russia has naval ports leased out in tartus and has been a key figure in supporting assad's government in the syrian civil war Syria even offers Russians war tours. If you ask the people, though, you might get a few other answers depending on who you ask. Many Syrians might say Algeria is a close friend. In fact, after Algeria gained independence from France, many Syrians came in to help reteach Algerians Arabic as it was banned from the country for over 100 years. In addition, Algeria often acts as the go-to mediator for any conflicts. Since the refugee crisis, though, Turkey has taken in the most refugees at over 3.5 million as of 2021, costing them over $8 billion in aid. Although the process hasn't been perfectly smooth, as it has put a stress on the nation to... And uh, this is one of the reasons uh, Turkey invaded parts of Syria, because it took in so many Syrian refugees. The Syrian refugees in Tur Turkey have been there for so long, they started their own communities, their own neighborhoods, basically, from those refugee camps. And uh, Turkey said, you know what, it's been long enough, and they just kind of invaded parts of uh, Syria, specifically around these parts that I'm uh, circling, they're starting to build up houses and stuff and hopefully like settle the, the Syrian refugees in their country into those new areas and also kind of act like a buffer zone as well. In turn, kind of the, the Syrians living there would have to be, you know, kind of a, should I say a vassal to, to the Turks? Because if you notice, if you type in the... Uh, Nagorno-Karabakh war that happened recently with an Azerbaijani victory, you would notice there are Syrian fighters in the area. So Turkey has kind of earned itself uh, a source of mercenaries as a result, so interesting. To some degree, nonetheless, Turkey has stepped up the most in regards to the crisis. When I asked you guys, the Syrian geography peeps, who you thought the best friends of Syria were though, no shocker, most of you ended up saying your fellow neighbors in the Levant, Lebanon, Jordan, and Palestinians. Some of you even included Iraq. The Levant countries overall get each other the best. They've shared the longest histories, their dialects are very similar, and their cultures are incredibly intertwined. Yeah, so you'd be surprised to not find like Saudi Arabia here or something in the cradle of Islam. Well, let me tell you, uh, af after the war, you know, despite uh, Saudi Arabia being one of the wealthiest countries in the world and having many uh, empty uh, facilities with air conditioning that people use when they want to go to the Hajj, for example, there are those facilities. Uh, the Arab and Gulf states have not accepted any Syrian refugees at all. A lot more have been accepted by uh, Europe. Uh, yeah, that's that's a thing. Mind. Lebanon actually hosts the second largest Syrian refugee population at about 1.1 million, which is about one fifth of their entire Just goes population. to show that they, they don't go. Did try to take over they don't Syria get along. The 20s, but otherwise, they've been really cool with each other. Jordan also usually acts as the conduit as, between as, as many people think, Palestinians when they want to either do business or just see each other, as Israel's borders have been closed off since the conflict. And Iraq and Syria have always been the two powerhouse cradles of civilization countries. Overall, when you put these countries all together, they can't help but deny that they are incredibly incredibly close and they'll always be there for each other. In conclusion, with Syria, you get something kind of like the Aleppo soap. You get a country that's been around for a long time and it's still going on in the 21st century and it's still precious and valued amongst its people just the way it is. And maybe, just maybe, the outside world should see it that way too. All right, that's it with all the S countries. Stay tuned. The first T country, Tajikistan, is coming up next. Okay, Tajikistan, interesting. Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to Flag Slash Fan Friday. Hope you like the Syria episode. I am filming on location once again. I'm in Abu Dhabi. There's mom. It's a long story if you've been following my social media. But anyway, let's get into it. There's, There's a Greenland on his flag. <laughs> Put it up here. This is the life I chose. Greenland right, on his so shirt. Let's kind of jump into the things that we didn't mention in the episode. First of all, I didn't even really properly introduce you to Gabs. He's one of my best friends. His name is Gabriel. I call him Gabs. He was actually very briefly in the Comoros episode. He had like one line. Years ago, he was actually my cameraman 
again when we went to Finland. We actually met the Prime Minister of Finland. And uh, yeah, I just uh, never got to introduce you guys to him formally. So. <laughs> Prime Minister Second, is just Damascus bored. <laughs> is really old. It's mentioned numerous times in ancient texts. And the locals there say that there's a very distinct smell, especially after the rain. Some say maybe it's because the city has so much jasmine. I don't know. Never been there. I'd love to go, though. I couldn't find a spot in the episode to slip in Queen Zenobia, the warrior queen. She reigned over the semi-independent Palmyrene Empire. Oftentimes, it even threatened Rome. Also, Flama was from here, one of the most famous uh, gladiators. So the word Al-Sham, you'll probably hear it a lot. In fact, you probably heard uh, Salam mention it in his uh, language section part. Al-Sham generally refers to the Levant countries and how they kind of share a unity. Yes, good evening. Oh, no worries. Yeah, you can you can come and uh, just clean when we check out. Yeah. <laughs> and then we got to get on the plane in like two hours. Look, I am what I am. You get what you see. Anyway, where was I? People, famous people of Syrian descent. <laughs> Some people, such as Steve Jobs, Paula Abdul, and Jerry Seinfeld, all... Yeah, uh, but Steve Jobs uh, grew up in an orphanage, and nobody really knew who exactly his parents were, but a DNA test revealed that... He, he he does indeed have a well. He, now that I look at him, yeah, he does very cool, have those distinct Levantine features. Interesting. So yeah, he's of Syrian descent. All have Syrian descent. Anyway, we gotta talk about the flag. So moving on, let's go. Syria. First of all, thanks to all the geography peeps that participated in this episode. You guys were awesome. I actually almost had a Syrian co-host in this episode, Gais. He lives in Los Angeles. Unfortunately, he had some schedule conflicts. He was busy with university stuff, so he couldn't make it. Gais, hope you liked the episode. I think I'm pronouncing that Gais, the Q, the Q. I feel like Arabic is always just a bunch of like I, I, and H, and Q, and K, K. Basically, yeah. <laughs> It's, I can never learn Arabic. My mom's like, you dumb <laughs> Anyway, let's move on to the flag. The flag of Syria is a horizontal Classic. tricolor of red, white, and black. These colors are generally regarded as pan-Arab colors and are used in numerous other flags in the mm -hmm. Arab nation. Within the central white band, you find two... Flip it around stars. and it's this the German Empire flag. The flag of the United Arab Republic in which Syria briefly joined up with Egypt as a single nation for about 13 years, ending in 1971. Each band and color of the flag represents a distinct dynasty as well as other aspects for representation. For example, the black know, represents the, red the Abbasid parts. dynasty, as well as having strong rule. The green of the stars represents the Fatimid dynasty. The white stands for the Umayyad dynasty, as well as a bright and peaceful future. And the red stands for the Hashemite dynasty. And it also stands for... Thanks to our favorite Irishman, yep. Potts, for making that anime. Oh, he's still here. In any case, throughout their history, they have used so many other flags. Not going to go through all of them. The more contemporary ones were based off of the Ottomans and the French. And this is where things are probably going to get a little touchy. Now, in Syria, you're probably going to see a bunch of other flags being flown around, depending on where you are and which yep. community you are visiting. First of all, the Syrian mm. opposition flag. This flag is generally used by people that are opposed to the current Assad regime. It is used by the National Syrian Coalition. It is often used in protests and areas where the national coalition has some level of autonomous alternative government rule. It was basically the flag they used after independence from France in the 1930s as the first Syrian Republic. After that, you might find other community flags. The most two commonly used ones will probably be the Kurdish and the Assyrian one. The Assyrian one has the sun in the that middle with the three wavy awesome. lines extending out in all four corners representing Just the three Yugoslavia of the Assyrian homeland. Everywhere. It also has like the Shamash and Asur thing. It's not. Like religious icons in ancient Mesopotamia. You also have the Kurdish tricolor and the Kurdish flag. Mommy, you, you're in my camera right now. If you, is that okay? Am I? You're in my yeah. You're in the camera right now. It's okay if you want to be in. You want to be in my video? Well, thank you. <laughs> Occasionally, you might see the Druze community with the oh, Druze you, flag, and of course the Armenians. No shocker. We'll probably fly the Armenian flag. It depends, but there are regional flags of community. Bosnians fly the Bosnian flag. Syria. And with that, we move on to the coat of arms, which is super simple. It's actually an Ooh, emblem. Not a coat I like of arms. that. The emblem consists of the hawk of Karaish. We've talked about this one before. The hawk is holding a shield bearing the flag of Syria. Underneath, there is a scroll with the words in Arabic: Syrian Arab Republic. Pretty simple. Yeah, you read not much right to, to left. Yes. Arabic. In the 20th century, they did have a few other iterations of this coat of arms, and this is the one they use today, unless you are part of the National Coalition, and this is what you would probably see in those areas. All right, so that is about it. Now that means you know what time it is. It's time for Geo Fan Mail Time. Okay, so that was the first uh, video in my new place, and uh, I'll be doing more and more videos from now on. So anyway, 
I think I'm just going to end the video here. Thank you all for watching, and as always, take care.